right, good morning, church. So uh, I saw some of you bobbing your heads to that, uh, that video just now, um, and I want to just take this opportunity to say we are recruiting for the music ministry. <laughs> so if you hear sounds and you like tunes, I mean, we encourage you to, uh, to talk to Pastor Ernest afterwards. Last week, we wrapped up a great series, and starting this Sunday, we are going to be um, having a new series called From This Day Forward, Pursuing Faith in Family Life. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the importance of marriage, the importance of relationships, and the importance of family. Now... For me, I have talked about marriage uh, at this church. I've talked about marriage in private and counseling sessions. I have done it elsewhere um, because I know how important marriage is to God and how important relationships, godly relationships are to God. And this morning, I was like, okay, God, what is it that you want me to say to your people and how should your word, your message, not my message, but God, how should your message be communicated to your people, and God put it on my spirit and provided me with a great opportunity to deliver a message about relationship and about marriage with the person that I have been doing it with for over 20 years. And so, SPC, I just ask that you give a warm welcome to my wife, Tashia, as she delivers this message with me. So y'all pray for me, (laughs) y'all pray for us, (laughs) and if we argue up here, just ignore us, okay? (laughs) So uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you, you are love, God. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about you. And so God, I thank you for the gift of relationship, I thank you for the gift of my wife. I thank you for the gift of relationships of people that go to this church and people in the community. And so, God, I just ask that you use us today to give a message of hope and encouragement to whoever may need it, God. Let your word and your word through our lives serve as an example, God, for your will. And we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, when we were preparing this message and we were talking about it, we were trying to figure out, okay, well, who in Scripture can we talk about? Who can we pull a lot of information from by examining the specifics of their lives within the Bible? And one of the things that, uh, that, that Tashia pointed out, and I agree with her, is that there aren't a lot of detailed information about married couples. We know who's married in the Bible, but there's not a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, details about who did what, when they did this, and how they went about it, and, and all of that. And so what we're going to try to do is just talk about some principles that we have gathered through Scripture and through the life of Joseph and Mary this morning. And that kind of leads us to our, our first point is that when you're in marriage, when you're in a relationship, when you love somebody, one of the things that you have to do is practice some privacy. And maybe that's why it's not a lot of detailed information about everyone's life, because it's important to practice privacy. And so, babe, I ask you, what does privacy look like for you? Well, we have six kids, so it's not a lot of that in our house. But um, as far as our, our personal relationship goes, it's, it's really important that our discussions are our discussions and our decisions are our decisions and it's not open to everybody else um, because at the end of the day, it's you and me. Right. It's you and me and it's, it's for us to do what God tells us to do when God tells us to do it. It's not, we can't take a survey and figure out, well, how would you do this? How would you do that? And it's also pretty difficult at the beginning to, to have the privacy because you're so used to not being one. 
you're used to being two different individuals and you go to who you go to for your information. So um, it's, a, it's a learned practice. Amen, amen. So Matthew 1, verse 19, the Bible says, and I actually start at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And so like we said, everything that you do, everything that goes on your relationships is not everybody's business. Joseph could have exposed all of Mary's business. Joseph could have went ahead and told his family. Joseph could have went ahead and told the community what was going on, that there was a baby on the way and it was not his. But because there was value in practice and privacy, Joseph said, you know what, I love her. And we're going to keep this between us. I may not understand and I might not like what's going on right now, but I don't have to go around telling everybody what's going on. And so we encourage you that when you're in your relationships, you don't have to put everything on social media and you don't have to go around telling everybody in your family what the other person did that you don't like, but it's important to practice privacy. Now, one of the next points that I want to talk about and that we want to talk about is practicing purity. Practicing purity. Matthew 1, verse 24 and 25, the Bible says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. It is important to practice purity. Now, purity in this example, we can think of it before you get married, before you get involved, don't have sex with the person that you are thinking about getting involved with, the person you're thinking about marrying. But really, purity goes beyond that. I've had enough conversations with men, and I've had my, my own challenges, and my wife and I have talked about some things. Practicing purity as a husband, for me, means that I have to be careful not to be checking out other women. Practicing purity for me means that I have to make sure that I am not indulging in pornography. Practicing purity for me means that I can't be thinking about other women and then I don't see any kids in here and then masturbating at home in private. And so when we're in marriage and when we're in relationship, it is so critical to make sure that if you want to keep that marriage strong, you have to be pure to your spouse. And so if I ask you, what, is, what does purity look like for you? Well, uh, along with those things, I think one of the biggest things that we have to understand is that it requires a higher level of respect, a higher level of um, transparency, because your spouse is your end-all, be-all. And if any of those thoughts or actions are directed towards someone else, then it takes away the respect it takes away the transparency because I should be able to, as a wife, share whatever I want with my husband. And if, like I said, those thoughts and actions and feelings are ever directed in the direction of someone else other than your spouse, then you've broken that. Whether it was an actual act or not, you've broken that trust, you've broken that level of respect that is required. And it if it is honored, it takes you to a higher level of intimacy. And I don't mean intimacy in very limited concepts. I mean broader. Like you can be out and about with your spouse and you guys share a look that you two get and it puts you at peace in whatever situation you're in. Or you can share a joke amongst other people. Everybody is laughing, but for you and your spouse, it's something else. It means something else. And I think those are the little moments that make the difference. But if you spoil it, then you don't have those little moments. And for me, little moments make 
the biggest impact, period, in life. It's always the little things. It's not the big ones. Amen. Amen. So it's, it's practicing purity when she won't. What? Practicing purity <laughs> when she don't. And practicing purity when she can't. But making sure that I love her enough to be able to wait for something even better when she's willing. Yeah. All right, so y'all pray for me. All right. <laughs> All right. Another thing that we've, that we've learned through studying the life of Mary and Joseph is the importance of practicing peace, just having peace in a marriage. Matthew 2, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I call my son. You see, one of the things that we kind of take from this part of their life is that Joseph and Mary took some time to get away from the drama. They did whatever they had to do to get away from the craziness in their environment so they could just have some peace between the two of them and this child. So what does peace look like for for you and for us? Because you said we had six kids. We do. We have six children. Um, And so, yeah, it's not a lot of peace either. However, it is something to be said for your mental health and the peace that comes with that. And to know that you walk into your home And that's your sanctuary, that's your place of rest. Even in the chaos, as long as there's peace between the two of us, the chaos is going to happen and we can walk through it together. And also that means that sometimes you leave the chaos and get some peace. Like every once in a while, you can go away without the kids. And or go to lunch. Even if it's the the last, you know, last minute thing. But that way you have a chance to reconnect and you have a chance to ease your mind. Because in this day and age, we have so much on our minds and there's always something that can be done. But I believe that peace and rest is just as important as work. Amen. So I can't stress enough. Tom and Mary have done a great job of planning some opportunities. It's in your bulletin. Consider getting away with the one you love because... It is so critical to just make sure you have time to recharge. One of the, uh, the next points that we want to talk about is practicing prioritizing. Practice prioritizing. And here we'll look at Matthew 2, verses 13 and, and 14. And here the Bible says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. See, Joseph was committed to his family. He was committed to his wife. That was his priority. And so when we're in in, in these relationships when we're trying to have and and to hold, when we're making sure that we're being committed to our vows, sometimes you have to make sure that if your priorities does not have your wife or your husband first, that you need to spend some time realigning that. In this story, Joseph knew that they had to get away, not him, not her alone, not the child, but the family had to get away. And so they practiced prioritizing the things which were most important. And at this time, the most important thing was their family. What does prioritizing look like for us? Well, I mean, it's not easy uh, because there are so many things that pull at you. Uh, When you have children, when you have jobs, when you have church responsibilities, there are a lot of things that can draw you away from each other. So you have to make it a point to make the time. Um, The time will just not magically appear. It's 24 hours, period. That's what you get. 
Uh, so you have to make that time. And it could be something as simple as, okay, so after the kids settle down, we will eat dinner together. Um, or when we drop the kids off at soccer practice, lo, let's go grab a cup of coffee. Um, or things like that, because if we don't do those things, if you don't make time for the little things, then the big things aren't gonna happen. Okay. Amen. So the next point that we wanna talk about through the life of Joseph and Mary is practicing proper prescriptions. Practice proper prescriptions. Matthew 1, 24 and 25, again, the Bible says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. I'm gonna read verse 24 again. The Bible says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. <clears throat> One of the things that I like about this story is that Joseph made sure he took time to get some godly counsel. Joseph was actually speaking to an angel, and, and I really like this point so much because I know as men, sometimes we just want to keep everything to ourselves. Well, sometimes as, as fellas, we, we'll bottle it up until it gets to a point where we just explode and we just spitting out a million things and she has no idea where all this is coming from is because we haven't taken time to seek counseling. And sometimes I know getting counseling is, is sometimes scary for some people, putting your, 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 your details out there in terms of somebody, finding somebody you can trust. But sometimes you go through so many things in marriage that you need, fellas, you need another guy that you can just talk to because believe it or not, you're not going through whatever you're going through by yourself and you're not the only one that has ever gone through it. We were watching an episode of uh, This Is Us. I don't even really watch This Is Us. And I don't watch it But if because, he wants to spend time with me. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and, and I want to spend time with you, babe. So, uh, so I, I was, was watching This Is Us with uh, uh, Tashia. And I guess it was last week or, or the week before. Mm -hmm. um, one of the characters had went through a traumatic experience. And it impacted him and it impacted his whole family but it was, he was really trying to deal with it himself. So this guy is literally having mental breakdowns when he refuses to talk to anybody. And then one of the best parts of this, this particular show was another guy just walked up to him and just sat down and was like, man, look, I've been through stuff and it helped me to talk to somebody. And so I encourage you to talk to somebody. The guy didn't want to listen at first. He put his headphones on. He was like, no, nah, the way I deal with stuff is I go for jobs. I get some exercise, and I'm good. And then later on in the episode, he almost beat somebody half to death because he was dealing with his issues. Fellas, I don't want y'all to get close to nearly killing somebody before you unpack the things that are weighing on your heart. And so especially for you guys, I just encourage you to practice proper prescriptions. Make sure you're talking to somebody. And what does that look like for you? Well, honestly, I think it goes beyond uh, just if we think of formal count counseling. I think that we as Christians have to understand that we're not meant to do this walk by ourselves. We are supposed to be in a fellowship of believers. So we need to be able to seek safe counsel from a fellow Christian. Um, and if you're in leadership, someone else that's also leading, because then they understand more what it is that you're going through. And when you're married, to have someone else that's especially been there, done that, is so invaluable. And sometimes we think we're an island unto ourselves, and we're not. Christ did not intend for us ever to be singular, um, whether that's a marriage, whether that's your family, whether that's a, a relationship 
other than those things. But if we don't realize that we need to reach out, we're, we're missing a valuable part of this relationship with Christ. And also, as far as following, uh, practicing prescriptions, I also believe that's not just your mental health, but it's your physical health as well. Because I think most of us want to be around for as long as we can possibly be around. And the only way for us to do that is to take care of the temple that he gave us. Amen. He only gave us one. And if we want to be married for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we have to be around for 30, 40, 50, 60 years first. Um, and, and we want to be a benefit to our spouse, a benefit to our families that entire time. So if we're not taking care of our physical man and our spiritual man and our mental health, we, we're missing pieces that Christ wants us to have. Amen. Amen. Right, so the next point that we want to talk about is practicing patience. Practicing patience. I don't know how Tashia has made it this long with me. I don't either. <laughs> Unless she had patience of the Lord. Because I put her through some stuff. We've had our fair share of crazy arguments and differences of opinions and I'll see you later and I'm ignoring your phone call. Like we've been, we've been through all that. So it is so important to practice patience. Let's look at it through the life of, of Joseph and, and Mary. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16 through 23. And the Bible says, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14, from David to the exile, to Babylon, and 14, from the exile to the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so, so Shia, what does patience look like for us or for you in marriage? Honestly, I don't did I do that? Maybe. Honestly, I don't consider myself a patient person. Um, but in marriage you have to be. You have to be patient. You have to um, consider your spouse's feelings above yourself. And sometimes that requires you to bite your tongue. A lot of times that requires you to bite your tongue. Um, <laughs> uh, because, <Next> point. <laughs> because I'll, especially when you know what you're going to say is not going to benefit the discussion. It's not going to benefit the argument. It's just going to prolong it. Um, and if any of you guys know me, I'm generally not one to bite my tongue. Um, Amen. I, hey, <laughs> I, tend to say what I feel and leave it out there. But in marriage, it's not important always to get the last word or to be right for that particular point. Um, I can say that in the beginning of our marriage, the first year was awesome. That second year, oh, mm. yeah, patience was not a priority. It was, it was ugly, it was ugly. Um, I remember thinking one time, okay, you can go back to your mom. I'm good. Um, <laughs> but we also, we also went into marriage very openly speaking that divorce is not an option. 
it's not an option. We're not going into it thinking it is an option. So what is it that we have to do in order to get over this particular hurdle? And it was patience and communication. Like you have to be patient because some, the other person is always going through something, always. It's the nature of being an adult. There is always something going on and sometimes you just can't hold it together in order to be who that other person needs and they can't for you either. So if, if it takes literally biting your tongue or putting your hand over your mouth, I've done it. Um, and I'm sure Sadiq has done it too because you know there are times when I say things out of my mouth. Um, but it's a conscious choice and it's a conscious effort that has to be made. It doesn't happen overnight. That's right. like uh, if, if anyone ever prays to God and asks for patience, you do know that means you're gonna have to go through something for you to use it. All right, so clearly she's saying I put her through some stuff. <laughs> now, and, and it, you know, I'm, I'm the first to admit, the Sadiq of 2020 is not the Sadiq of 2010. It's not the Sadiq of the year 2000 when we got married. It's not the Sadiq of 97 when we started dating. Going into scripture, and I want to hold it here on this verse on the screen of verse 22, but I'm going to read back. The Bible says, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. A whole lot went on in that 14 generation cycle each three times that's talking about in the scripture. And the Bible says all of this went on, everything that happened in the Old Testament, all of that went on, all of the exile to Babylon, all of that went on to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Sometimes in our relationships, we go through a whole bunch of stuff. So what God wants to be fulfilled can be fulfilled in your relationship and especially in your individual life. Like we said, we've gone through a lot. We've gone through the loss of a child. We've gone through sleeping in separate beds. We've gone through yelling at the top of our, our lungs and thank God it hasn't been this year. <laughs> I really mean, thank God, it hasn't been <laughs> this year. But the Bible says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophets. So there is value in practicing patience. We may not always get what we want, or in this case, she might not always get who she wants right away. But it, when she's patient and when I'm patient, we see exactly what the Lord had saw before we even got together. The seventh point is the importance of practicing partnership. Practicing partnership. Luke chapter 2, starting at the 22nd verse, the Bible says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And later in that chapter, the Bible says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents, when the parents, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. And the verses continue. The child's father and mother, the child's father and mother, father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken. 
against, when you really pull apart the life of Joseph and Mary, you see that they were talking about the father and mother, they were talking about the parents, that they were talking about Simeon blessed them together. There was partnership that existed in everything that they did. Joseph didn't just send Mary and the child to Egypt, but they went together. Their life was done together. Why? Because the two had become one. And so it is so important when you are married, when you are in these committed relationships, to make sure that you are truly partners. But yeah, and it, again, it's something else that you have to learn um, because it's whenever you get married, um, even though we got married pretty young, we had both been out of college and used to doing things on your own. And when you get married and you realize when you leave work, oh, I can't just hang out with my coworkers. I might need to call my husband and let him know what I'm doing or see if there were other things planned. Um, I know for us, for me especially, at the beginning, it was like I don't understand why I just can't do what I want to do when I want to do it. Um, why do I have to ask him anything? Yeah, I couldn't understand. Um, <laughs> and of course, for Sadiq, he's like, hello, I'm your husband. Why? I, um, you would think that it was automatic, and it's not. Um, but it, and it probably took us a few real good years of practicing before it became second nature. And today it's second nature. I was on the phone the other day with some telemarketer trying to sell us something. And it was something that I would have considered purchasing. But I said, you know, I need to talk to my husband first before I um, commit to this. And he said, oh, well, we can just make the appointment. And it, then if it doesn't work, you can cancel it. I said, no, I'm not willing to make the appointment until I talk to my husband. And I'm sure it caught him a little bit off guard, but... It is what is necessary to make our marriage work and to keep doing it this way. We are two individuals, yes, but we are one together. And if we don't check in with each other, this is not going to work. Um, and especially, we have to be a united front against, against our children. Um, That's right. <laughs> because um, at, from the two-year-old to the 16-year-old, man, they know how to work it. And they try their best every to day. play one against the other. Every day. Uh, yeah, every day. And uh, it's times where we choose each other, and they're like, what? I don't understand. Hey, it was, we were together before you. We will be together when y'all leave our house, bless Jesus. <laughs> so we have to be a partnership. We have to do it together. If we don't do it together, it won't work. Amen, amen. So, so it is so important, like, when I see Terry, I don't just think of Terry, I think of Cindy. When, when I see Charles, I don't think of just Charles, I think of Vanessa, I see Tom, I think of Mary. You know, when I see Bill, I think of Kathleen. When I see Mike, I think of Margo. When I see one person, I understand that they're an individual, but I'm thankful that we are surrounded, at least at this church, by partnership. And God set that example from the very beginning, the father was in partnership with the son. The husband is in partnership with the wife. This is supposed to represent Jesus' relationship with the church anyway. And so that having that partnership, it ain't all on Tashia, even if it feels like it sometimes. It ain't all on her. It's not all on me, but we're in partnership. And that leads us to our final point this morning as we study the life of Joseph and Mary. That final piece is to practice perseverance. Practice perseverance. So many scriptures that could have been used for this. Ecclesiastes is, is in your bulletins. We could look at the whole life of Joseph and Mary because they went through some stuff and they stayed together. It takes a lot to persevere when you know you have a king trying to kill your child. And yet you're still willing to say, you know what? We're still in relationship. We're still partners. We're going to persevere through that. And so they went off to Egypt and they waited until the king died. And then they came back. No matter how long it took, they came back together. They persevered 
through those challenges. And so persevering in relationship is so critical. So, babe, what is perseverance? How have you persevered? What does that look like for, for us? I mean, it's, it's a long-term plan. It's not a sprint. Uh, I know people say it's a cliche, but it's not a sprint. It is making conscious choices every day to do this thing together and to know that it is till death do we part, whether I cause it or not. Um, <laughs> but it, it is... Wow. It is <laughs> That's a confession. Make sure we record that. But it's permanent. It's, it's, we made the choice. We were adults. We sat down and said, you know what? This is what we're going to do. We're going to live our lives together, and we're going to do it the way Jesus tells us to do it. And it's not um, you wake up in the morning every morning and it's roses. No, because I'm not a morning person, and anybody that's been on a mission trip with me knows that. Um, don't talk to me in the morning. And Sadiq is a morning person, and yes. he wakes up bubbly. Yes. And there's many a morning, even almost 20 years in, I look at him and I'm like, why do you keep talking to me in the morning? Because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and that is his response. And I'm like, oh, blessed be. But it's doing what almost seems like the mundane all the time because it's what you do. And you, you come to enjoy it. It comes to be second nature. And you wouldn't do it any other way. And as long as you keep those lines of communication open, the perseverance comes because you know there's no option. It's no option. Divorce is not an option. We're going to do this. Yep. And there may be times we don't like each other, but we always love each other. Amen. And there may be times where he has to do his thing, I have to do my thing to get ourselves together, and then we come back together because every day is every day. And we all know this. We all know what um, it looks like some mornings when we get up and you have this list to face. But to know that you have someone in your corner, you have someone that's got your back and you're going to face it together, you can do it the next day and the day after that and the day after that. Yeah. Again, point number one was practicing privacy. So we intentionally didn't put all our stuff out here this morning. But I will say that we have persevered through, as I mentioned, the loss of a child, our, our first child. We have persevered through going to two separate churches for like three and a half years. Yes. When, when we had an infant and a toddler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some very difficult times. We have persevered through tough financial times. Like really, really tough financial times. We have persevered through tremendous arguments and we've persevered through folks wanting my wife and folks wanting her husband. Which is never allowed. Never. Ever. And, but we have to be on the same accord for that because we have to put a united front out there. Yeah. So we've persevered through a lot. And so if you get nothing else, from this message, and prayerfully you guys got something today, but if you get nothing else, just know that as long as you acknowledge the Lord as your personal Savior, that he's already overcome everything that you ever have to face. And so the things that you might need to persevere through, the things that you might need to get through in your life with that committed partner, he, you could do it because Jesus already paid the cost for everything. And so we encourage you guys this morning to make sure that from this day forward that you do everything necessary to keep the marriage tight, to keep the family close, and to serve as a great example for the next generation. Amen. Amen. So let us pray. So God, we, we thank you for our marriage and our relationship, God, but 
God, I thank you for your relationship with us because if that didn't exist, we wouldn't have been able to make it. And so, God, I just ask that you continue to watch over us and watch over all of the couples here. And, God, I ask that your word be so unlimited, God, that if there are people that don't go to this church that need this message, you drop it on them, God. And so, God, we just ask that you continue to help us be committed to each other, continue to help all families do what is necessary for your will to be done. And we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.